Okay, so in this video, we're going to continue with our modeling discussion. Uh, primarily, we're going to talk about classification models uh, in this video. So we're going to be working with the IRIS data set that we first looked at in the Plotly discussion. So just to remind ourselves about that data set, we're going to pull in that package along with pandas and numpy, and then we're going to look at that 3D scatter plot that we were able to see um, of our, at least three of the four variables available in our IRIS data set. So this is a classification data set. We have three different kinds of irises, and we can see on our 3D scatter plot that uh, we, want, we want to be able to do is identify Given the information we have available, uh, we want to be able to identify which, given the sepal length and the pedal, sepal width and the pedal length and the pedal width, our four total variables, we want to try to be able to identify what kind of iris this is. And we can see that for the setosas, that's going to be fairly straightforward. Our model should be able to handle all of them. But there is overlap between the versicolor and the virginica. And so our model is going to try to separate those out as much as they possibly can in order to make good classification predictions. So this is the data set that we're working with. So if we just print the data frame, this is what it looks like. So we have species, uh, which is the name of the species. Species ID, these are just one, two, threes. Uh, the species has numbers. And then these are the four variables that we have to work with, our sepal length, sepal width, pedal length, and pedal width. Now, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to turn our um, species variable into um, uh, dummy variables. Uh, we want to actually use the logistic regression function to start with, and the, regi re, the re logistic regression can, is only a binary classifier, can only do 0, 1. And so we're going to use these dummy variables as essentially setosa or other virginica or other versicolor or other kind of, of models. And then we can use the original ones uh, in order to um, actually do some of our other uh, classification models that can handle more than two classes. But our first example of logistic regression can only do two classes. So I'm going to convert my species to get dummies. Um, I'm going to use SP as my prefix. And then um, I'm going to drop the first one, uh, which I believe will be the setosa that will get dropped. And then we're going to tack those on and cat those to the end of the data frame. And then we're going to drop both the species and the species ID. Again, for logistic regression, we can't use a one, two, three variable. We don't know that they're ordered in any way. Um, and so this that's not going to work for this. You can't use regular regression on things that don't have a like actual order. So here's my new uh, data frame. I have my four original variables, and my species has been replaced with um, uh, zero, 00 would be setosa, um, zero, 01 would be virginica, and 10 would be versicolor. Now, as we saw with the regression, we're going to import some models and some metrics from the uh, SK Learn package. Now, the metrics on logistic regression and classification in general um, tend to focus on a confusion matrix, uh, which essentially tells you how many things have been correctly classified versus how many things were incorrectly classified and in which categories, uh, rather than some kind of like an error calculation, because we don't have numerical predictions, we have classifications, so categorical outcomes. 
So again, we're going to create our test and training data that we saw in the last video. So I'm going to sample 80%, um, set my random seed, and then the remaining 20%, uh, I will drop those 80% and put the rest in the test set. So this is my training set. And then this is my test set. And as uh, previously, we're going to pop out Um, so first we're going to pop out the VersaColor, uh, because we're not going to dis be distinguishing in this example from the VersaColor and the Virginica. We're going to be trying to say Setosa and other. So I'm going to pop out the VersaColor since I'm not doing that distinction. And then I'm going to save the Virginica column as my test set labels. I'm going to predict, I guess, I in this case, I'm going to predict whether or not it fits in the Virginica category. All right. Now I'm going to build my logistic regression. Um, now, some of these um, modeling um, packages, they have some attributes that you can set. Um, there are some defaults that sometimes work perfectly fine. Uh, but again, look at the documentation for the specifics. Uh, in this case, we're using the solver called liblinear. Again, we're setting a random state because there is some randomness involved. And then we're going to create a fit between the training set and the training set labels. And you can get predictions to come out of your regression your logistic regression model in one of two ways. You can get them to report probabilities or you can get them to report zero ones. So here's our probabilities. Uh, and here is our classifications. So typically, as you can see from here, um, if you, the probability is higher, in the second case, in the second column, like this is 95%, then you'll get classified as a one. And if you are closer on this end to a smaller value, you're less than 50%, by default, you'll get classified as a zero. And then we can do the same thing for the test set. Again, these are our probabilities. This seems very high to be a zero. Lots of zeros at the top, some in the middle, and then we've got some at the end. Now we want to look at the model score. Essentially, how good did the model do? Uh, according to the training set, 99%, according to the test set, 93%, it's not too bad. Again, one almost expects that the, um, the test set will be less accurate than the training set since the training set is what built the model in the first place. Um, but you do still want the training set or the test set values to still be reasonably high. If we build the confusion matrix for our um, test, our train set, um, this means that 78% were correctly classified as zero. One value was classified as a one that should have been a zero. Um, nothing that should have been a one was classified as a zero. And 41 things that should have been classified as a one were correctly classified as a one. So that's the 99% percent accuracy. If we look at the same thing for our test set, then we see that there were actually two, uh, the reason it came down is there were two misclassifications. And of course, the data set is smaller, so that has a much bigger impact on the percentages. We can um, 
actually plot the confusion matrix if we want um, so we can actually look at it. So here we're going to calculate our confusion matrix based on the test set labels and the test predictions. Um, we're going, this is this is one of the reasons why I don't really like using matplotlib um, by itself, uh, because you do have to set all of these properties manually. So here we're going to create um, some, uh, we're going to create our basic plot. Uh, we're going to make our figure size eight by eight. Um, we're going to um, show in centimeters. We're going to not put a grid on it. Uh, we're going to set our tick marks and our labels. We're going to set our Y limits. We're going to go through our confusion matrix and we're going to plot the various things and then show text in the center to display the counts. Again, this is not at all necessarily intuitive, um, but this is what you have to do when you're working with matplotlib without a, a wrapper on it like Seaborn. But this uh, is a way of creating a map of our confusion matrix. Um, again, color coded. Um, the high, the lighter values are uh, the larger numbers, and we have the annotations printed on them. And again, you can they we color coded the annotations in red so that they stood out against all of the different colors. Um, but again, you can modify some of these default colors in addition to that. Now, there are other things that you can do um, with logistic regression, other tweaks that you can make. So there are other parameters that you can adjust. And so I've added one here um, and we can see how that might adjust the outcome. And it did not adjust our percentage accuracy at all. Again, if your model turns out to be very poor, then some of these other properties may be useful for making modifications to the model. And you would want to experiment with some of these alternate settings in order to see if any of them got you better outcomes. Now, if you want to, the default um, break between um, plotting something as a zero versus plotting something as a one is typically set at 50%, but you can manually take the probability predictions and convert them to um, like using rounding or other methods, convert them to classification scores in other ways. So you can, in principle, use some kind of an if statement as I have here to adjust that cutoff point. So you can make it higher or lower in order to um, adjust those predictions, the break point for those predictions. Now, there may be reason to do this. Sometimes you might get a better um you might get more accurate predictions. Um, sometimes it's just to cover your bases. So um, you may be willing to sacrifice a little bit less accuracy in order to make sure that you don't leave out certain people from a positive result. So for example, if you are doing a cancer study, um, it is better to maybe think that the person has cancer and then run them through some extra tests to verify, no, in fact, they don't have cancer rather than uh, say, oh, they don't have cancer. And then six months later, find out, oh crap, they do have cancer and now they're gonna be dead. So when they maybe could have been treated. So there are occasions where erring one side or the other of 50% may be beneficial for other reasons. And so you can do that manually. And so here I've taken, again, the predictive probabilities and I've set my if statement to be flip it if it's above 0.84. So if it's lower than that, so between 0.5 and 0.84, it would previously have been classified as a one and now it's going to be classified as a zero instead. So again, this may be something that is valuable in certain contexts. Um, we can also calculate um, essentially how many 
correct predictions that we had. Uh, in this case, um, we're taking the training set labels, those are the actual zero ones, and then we're taking off the predicted set that we just previously calculated. Um, all of those that come out to be zero are going to be correct predictions, and all of those that come out to be one or minus one will be incorrect predictions. So in this case, we ended up with five incorrect pred predictions. Again, that's more than what we had before, but again, depending on how that balances out, what your the purpose of making this adjustment is, that may be a trade-off that is good in the long run. We can calculate the error percentage in this way by calculating the length of the training set labels and then dividing the um, error percentage is, again, the sum of this difference the, and the absolute value divided by the total length. And then the accuracy is one minus that error percentage. Um, so even with adjusting this up to 0.84, we are still getting a 90, almost 96% accuracy. So again, that's pretty high accuracy. And again, in certain circumstances, it may be valuable to catch more incorrect ones in one direction than to miss them in the opposite direction. All right, so, so k-means technically is a clustering algorithm, but it is often also used for classification. And so that's another one of these that we're going to look at. So we're going to import the k-means. And this is one of those packages. K-means uses a distance metric. And so it does prefer to have the data rescaled uh, in order to run correctly, in or run most effectively. Uh, you can run it without rescaling it, but um, it will not do as good generally uh, as when you do the scaling. Now, if your variables are all about the same length to start with, then it doesn't really matter, but um, it does matter uh, when your variables are much different in value from each other. So it may not make that much difference on this particular iris data set because the sepal length and petal width and all those other variables are all about similar sizes. Um, but if you are dealing with like number of children and income in a particular data set, those are wildly different values. And so if you want the number of children to have an impact on the model at all, you will need to scale things. Now, k-means starts by initiating a random set of cluster assignments. We're going to choose three of them since our data set, the IRIS data set, has three classes in it. Um, we're going to have n initial uh, initiations, and we're going to run for a maximum of 300 uh, intervals until it finally settles down and stops. And because, again, it's random. The whole point of k-means is you pick some random starting point, you calculate the distance to the nearest uh, data points, then you re-average them, you change the center, and then you repeat that until the centers stop moving. And then those become the centers of your clusters. And we're going to set the random state. We're not using zero this time. We're using something else. And then we're going to fit our k-means model to our rescaled uh, data set. Again, you can generally ignore these warnings as long as the thing runs properly. Now, inertia is sometimes a way of uh, identifying uh, how well the k-means is functioning. You can also print out the cluster centers. So here we have um, four dimensional centers, uh, three centers. Uh, the number of iterations that it ran, it only took five iterations to settle down, even though we set the max to be 300, it didn't need them. And then the labels, uh, these are which of the clusters that the things belong to. So um, zero, one, and two, remember we have three clusters and Python starts counting at zero. Now, 
for these, you would then need to identify um, uh, to do this for classification, you would then need to identify which of the values in the training set, for instance, um, what what is the zero? Is that Setosa? Is that Virginica? Or is that Versicolor? They're random, so we have no idea from just looking at this. Um, and then you would use that as an as a way of matching up the clustering to the classification. This would be a, called a semi-supervised learning process, as opposed to a fully supervised process that we were using in logistic regression. Another common classification method is K nearest neighbors. So here we're gonna import that uh, K nearest neighbors classifier. Um, now, typically you choose um, which classify, the number of neighbors you're going to use to vote on um, what class the thing belongs to. You can set it to be one, Generally, particularly if you're only doing a binary classifier, avoid even numbers because it will break the tie with a random flip. And so it's very unstable. Um, you could certainly use more. Uh, we could set this to one. We could set it to five if we wanted to. But it would take then the five closest points and it would have them vote to decide uh, what classification it goes into. Um, it's harder to predict exactly um, how many neighbors you need uh, when you're doing three classes or more classes because you don't really know where the ties could happen. Um, so generally for these, uh, to get the best number of neighbors to use, you would want to experiment and see which ones worked out um, the best. Uh, we're going to fit our model and then we're going to look at our predictions again. We're using a distance metric in K nearest neighbors. So we are reusing the scaled features that we looked at before. And again, this is a classifier. This is using the train set labels from earlier. So it's basically, again, a binary classifier. Um, if we had set up the train set labels previously to be um, the Setosa, Virginica, and Versicolor, the one, two, three, then maybe we would get a slightly different outcome. And again, we can compare um, our predictions versus our training set labels and uh, count, use that to count the number of correct versus incorrect um, predictions. Now, other kinds of classifiers that are available for you to experiment with are things like the random forest classifier. Uh, again, we're gonna build our, this is an ensemble model. It uses essentially a bunch of decision trees uh, and then it has them vote on how to classify the model. And we are going to fit that again, training set versus train set labels. And we are going to make some predictions and we can compare those predictions to our labels. And in this example, there are no differences. The predictions and the training set labels are exactly the same in every case. And so the, this produced no errors. Um, you can also use this describe function in order to get a summary of all of your variables. Uh, if you add the transpose function, then it will print them in this order. If you don't use the transpose function, then it will print them this way. So this is a little harder to read, especially uh, with these variable names. So sometimes it's useful um, to use the transpose function so that the variables are rows and then our measurements are the columns. And again, this is something that you can use in other kinds of uh, tabular outputs that we've seen from pandas. Um, and then we're also going to look at very briefly uh, an MLP classifier. This is a neural network classifier now, the neural networks um, can be quite 
complicated to work with. Um, you have to set a wide variety of parameters. And in fact, the number of available parameters are kind of ridiculous. So initially, you definitely should choose the number of, of hidden layer sizes. Um, here, I've chosen five, three, and two, and the max iterations is 1,000. This is kind of the minimum thing that you want to do, and you want to hope that the model converges. Again, you can generally ignore these warnings. Um, although in this case, it says that the max iterations um, hasn't converged, so that's not great. Um, if you get something where it says it hasn't converged, then that means that the model is probably not very reliable. And you should, again, adjust either adjust the max iterations to see if more calculations are going to do the job or adjust the, the numbers of hidden layers in your model to see if that's going to make a difference. Um, there are a bunch of other potential uh, parameters that you can set in these neural networks. Um, you have your activation type, you have uh, parameter values for alpha, the batch size, um, all these other para parameters, epsilon, things that get used in the stochastic gradient descent, your hidden layers that we talked about earlier. Is the learning rate going to be constant or exponential or otherwise, other things like that? Again, number of iterations. There's all of these extra parameters. Um, what kind of solver you're using? Are you shuffling? Sometimes in neural networks, if you train them on like the same thing, every same outcome repeatedly, and then you switch to a different outcome, it doesn't learn as well. Um, so shuffling the results uh, is often common. And again, look at the documentation to see exactly what the alternatives are for some of these options to see if they are going to produce better results. I did not get a warning this time um, with all of these parameters set like I did the last time. So that's a good sign. And then I can make my predictions. Again, it was fitted without feature names because I took the feature names out. And then again, I can pull in my metrics and I can get a confusion matrix to see if um, I can do a better job. And in this particular case, um, I have 50 in my training set that are being misclassified. In fact, I have more in this case that are being misclassified than are being correctly classified. So again, what does that suggest? That suggests that maybe um, the number of layers that I have are too few or too many. Um, I may need to adjust other parameters um, because this is not doing a very good job relative to previous examples. My logistic regression was doing 99% and I'm this is definitely not 99%. Um, now, you don't always know when you're doing these uh, models, which model is going to be the best. Uh, neural networks sometimes work extremely well, but they also are opaque and they're like black boxes and nobody, nobody really understands how uh, to interpret them. Um, but if accuracy is your goal, then sometimes you don't care about that. Um, if you do care about interpretation, then a simpler model like KNN or logistic regression are more appropriate. And this is our classification report. Um, now the classification report is going to give you a bunch of values, including your F1 score, your recall and precision. It's gonna give you your accuracy, which for this one was not very good. Um, and also um, a bunch of additional statistics that can be very useful for um, understanding how well or poorly your um, classification model is doing. Now, the last thing that I wanted to talk about in this discussion, again, it's, again, it seems kind of random, but um, you know, some of my students are using uh, different kinds of data for their final project. And so we wanna make sure that they have uh, a set of tools that they can use in order to um, work with the data that they have. So I'm trying to be as 
uh, maybe uh, broad and narrow as possible. Uh, so broad and shallow. So broad number of topics, but we're not going to be able to go sort of in depth into them um, that and maybe not as in depth as one might like. Uh, in future uh, videos outside the context of this course, um, then I may put together uh, more videos that go further in depth into in these individual analyses, as opposed to just sort of giving you a taste of them. Now, in this uh, particular uh, end of this lecture, we're going to talk a little bit about regular expressions. So we're going to use the package RE, and I believe this is a standard built-in package. You don't have to install it. Particularly, we're going to do some uh, work on the phrase, the rain in Spain is mainly on the plane. Uh, you can, of course, your text string be an imported document, as we've seen in the past. Uh, that will also work as an input to this uh, regular expression analysis. So in this case, we're going to try to find all the, the combinations of A and I next to each other in this text string. And the length of this string is going to tell us how many of them there are. In this case, there are four in the rain, in the Spain, and in mainly, and on the plane. We can split our text string at spaces. That's what this uh, escape S stands for. So now we have a string that is just made up of individual words. So it's split it at the space. So we have a list of individual words if we needed to, again, if we're doing natural language processing or something like that, we wanted to eliminate sort of the stop words that don't really mean anything like the thes and the ises and stuff like that. Um, then we have a list of words where we can, we can further clean this. Um, if I wanna only split it one time, so only at the first space, I just want the first word and then the rest of the sentence, I can add, this number of characters at the end. If I wanted to do it at the fourth space, then I would put a four here. Um, this one is going to substitute. The sub stands for substitute. So it's going to replace the spaces with hyphens. The rain in Spain is mainly on the plane. Here, I want to look for a word with uppercase S at the start. So this is an escape character followed by S, and then another escape character. Um, this gives the starting position of the word. That's what this backslash, uh, backslash B stands for. And then so it's going to start with S and then have other stuff that follows it. And the location of where that occurs is at the 12th position out of fifth, out of 17. Now, print string uh, prints the whole string where the word appears. Um, whereas the group function here is just going to print the word. So again, all of these are predicated on this thing. So it found, it searched for words that had uppercase S, and then here it printed the entire string, and here it just printed the word that started with an uppercase S. Now, this find all function, if I don't put just AI in quotes, I put a set of letters in these square brackets, then it's going to look for any occasion of A, M, or T in the word and tell me how many of them there are. It's not looking for the sequence mat. It's looking for an M, an A, or a T. In this case, I'm looking for the string A, I, N, and then any, and then not necessarily a, a space afterwards, but anything can come after it. But I need A, I, N, in sequence with potentially more stuff. So the rain in Spain, mainly on the plane. So sometimes this is the end of the word, rain, Spain, plane, but mainly that plus uh, is still catching mainly. 
Now, if you want to dig more into manipulating uh, text with regular expressions, there is um, there are nice um, code examples and things like that that you can find here and certainly other places. Uh, if you Google for them, you'll find a whole bunch of resources to get you started. Again, if you're manipulating text string, this is the whole sort of extra class of analysis um, that is often not covered in, uh, or again, or maybe briefly in traditional data science courses, unless you're going into speech analysis or natural language processing of some sort, because all of the mechanics and the machinery that you have to use are very different than traditional statistical analyses. 